Amen. You know, as our, we're singing that, uh, that last song, it's, uh, give, me, give me a faith that doesn't wander. Uh, sometimes when we pray that, uh, we don't realize or sing that, we don't realize what we're singing, but it is the context of what we've been talking about. Because you see, when we as Christians ask God to give me that kind of faith that doesn't wander, to give me that kind of faith that steps out, then what we're inviting into our life is difficulty. Because what grows our faith beyond the level that it is, is when we have to get to a place that's difficult that we can't change the circumstances and we have to trust God at a deeper level. That's what grows our faith. And you know, sometimes in our Christian journey, we get to that place and our faith falters and, and we begin to uh, get to that place where we're like, God, uh, I, I don't want this, I don't want this anymore. But what we don't realize is, is what's coming out of it is a stronger faith that allows us to walk in places that we've never walked before and that's what we really want isn't it we want that kind of faith and so what God is saying is listen in order to get there I've got to take you beyond where you are because uh, I talked to so many believers and your faith is really based on this whole idea that I am living on my feelings and not on my faith and sometimes we don't know the difference but when the storms of life come we will know the difference because when the storms of life come, feelings are not enough, I promise you. You can't feel your way through it. You've got to trust your way through it. Amen. Amen? And my hope for all of us is, is that we get past the feeling stage. Because the feeling stage is that stage where we're always crying out to God. God, rescue me in my moment of despair. God, rescue me in my moment of trial and tribulation. God, rescue me because I have a difficult day. God, rescue me because my check's late and I don't know how I'm going to pay my bills. God, rescue me. We got all these little things. We're always saying, God, rescue me. And when God's saying, listen, I don't need to rescue you. I'm trying to grow you. So why don't you grow and learn to trust me and quit trying to call out for me to relieve you when I want to grow you beyond where you are so that when the trials of life come, you're not waiting for God to say, hey, throw me a lifeline. God, help me, rescue me. Now listen, there are times in our life, Christians, where we get so overwhelmed, we need to cry out to God. But there are also things that we need to grow past, don't we? We need to grow up and get over it. We need to grow up and be bigger than what it is because God has designed you to be bigger than that. He's designed you to be able to look at those things and say, you know what? You're not going to conquer me because my God has already conquered you. Amen? And so when we move beyond this whole feeling faith where I'm just looking for a feeling, I came to church looking for a feeling, I read my Bible looking for a feeling, and I get to the place where I come to church to encounter God, I open my Bible to encounter God because I want this relationship with Him. I don't want to feel something. I want to know that I know Him, and I want to know that when I get in the midst of any difficulty that my God is able, and I believe it, and I walk in it. That's what happens in my life when I move beyond this, this superficial kind of faith because it's this kind of faith that doesn't allow me to stand during the temptations and trials of life. It's this kind of faith that so many Christians never grow beyond. And so we come to church and we leave excited. But the first thing that happens, we're in despair again. The first difficulty at home, the first difficulty in traffic, if you will. It's just the little small things in life to just wreck us. I want you to understand something. You have more than that. There is more in you than you realize because God has implanted in you and I. And we have to learn to tap into it so that we are able to say, God, I want to walk on water with you. I'm tired of walking on the sidewalk. I want to walk on water. I want to do something bigger. I want to be involved in something bigger. I want to move beyond this superficial faith that's wrecked every time something difficult comes along. Because if you and I are going to have immovable faith that doesn't waver in the difficulties of life, that doesn't waver because of circumstances, then you and I have to come to this place, as we talked about, where we are securely anchored 
to our immovable Savior. And because we are anchored, we are not moved in all of those things. And that's what God wants to do. He wants us to be the anchor because no matter what happens, I'm secure. So in this pursuit, I want you to understand something. In the book of 2 Peter, as we've been, been diving into it, he tells us how we have this kind of faith. And one of the things I want you to understand is, is that, that Peter was one of those guys that experienced that moment when Jesus was with the Father. And the Father revealed his self to those guys in that moment in the garden. And they were so overwhelmed. They didn't know how to respond to it because they saw Jesus in his glory. They saw him in a way that nobody else has ever seen him. And, and they were blown away. They were wanting to build tabernacles. They wanted to build all this stuff, you know, to create a place of worship. And, and what Jesus was wanting them to do is they, he wanted them to see a part of him that they had never seen so that they would believe in such a way that they never believed. And in the, even in light of that, though, I want you to understand, even in light of that, Peter writes to us, realizing that we haven't had that experience and that he writes to us understanding that the rest of the church needs to understand how you become anchored even though you haven't had that experience and this is what he says to us which I think is so powerful as we look in second Peter verse 19 chapter 1 he says above all you must realize and so here's what he's saying he's saying listen I want you to understand, I know that you haven't been there, but let me tell you how you stay anchored. Let me tell you what I still lean into because this is a source that makes me immovable and my faith immovable. He says, above all, you must realize that no prophecy in scripture ever came from the prophet's own understanding or, for, or from human initiative. No, they, the, the, the prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit as they spoke from God. And so here's what he says. He said, listen, in light of all of my experiences, I want you to understand, I go back to something that anchors me to Jesus because you see, the anchor is Jesus, but Jesus is not here in, in physical form, but he's here in his word and his word is living and active and his word is powerful and his word reveals his presence and his person. And so Peter says, listen, you can encounter Jesus even though you weren't in that moment. You can encounter him through his word. Why? Because when the prophets spoke, those, those people that, that prophesied in the Old Testament and, and the, the, the apostles in the New Testament, when they spoke, he said, listen, they weren't speaking their own words. So what I want you to grasp, church, is when we read this Bible, we are not simply reading words. We are reading the very things thoughts and mind and heart of God himself. If you want to know God, he revealed himself to you in scripture. Amen. And so he's saying that the way that this came about was not that some guy got up and said, you know what, I think I'm going to write some scripture today. It says that he was moved or impressed or compelled by the Holy Spirit to write down not his words, but the very thoughts and mind and words of God. And so when this was penned, they were writing what God through the Holy Spirit was telling them. And so we can understand that when we look at the Bible, we're not looking in an ordinary book. We are looking at a timeless book that comes from a supernatural God that so loves his people. He says, I want to give you a piece of me so that you will never wander from me. And so that you'll know me and be able to understand me and you'll know how to live your life. And so he's saying to us, listen, you've got to be anchored and understand that the power of scripture comes because these guys that I have empowered and inspired, they wrote the very words of God because the Bible is God's inspired word that man pinned down and he wrote those thoughts. And so, so here's the thing though, so many Christians give more weight to what people say than they do what God says. So many of us, listen, so many of us, 
would rather go to the Christian bookstore and pick a book up and read it about God rather than reading the word of God that is from God. We'd rather go get a self-help book that makes me feel better about myself or go to a psychologist that tells me all about my problems and how to overcome them rather than going to the creator of the world that knows every thought you've ever thought or ever will think that can cure anything about you. We'd rather go to them than to him. And what happens in that case is, is that we become these people that are moved by the things of life, that we're moved by the circumstances of life, and that our lives vacillate back and forth. And when difficulty comes, we don't know how to handle it because we haven't been going to the source of truth, which is God. And, and, and this is what it is. Listen. So many of us, this is what our anchor looks like. Now listen, if you want to have titanic faith, you can't be tied to this. And when you and I allow all this other stuff to come into our life and be our God, and we set aside the word of God, we have set ourselves up for failure. Because we have anchored ourselves not to Jesus, not to the person of the word, and not to the word itself that reveals the person of Jesus. We've anchored ourselves to the philosophy of man, the ideas of man, the feelings of man, the direction of man. And we get to that place and we go to Bible college, we go to, go to these, uh, these schools, these, uh, these higher education, as you will, so that they can make you smarter. But what they do is make you dumber because they take you away from the source of your anchor and you begin to falter in life and you wonder, why your world is falling apart is because your world is anchored to the wrong thing. <laughs> but listen, I don't know about you guys, but I had rather be anchored to something that's bigger. I had rather be anchored to something that's stronger. I had rather be anchored something that's immovable and so when we begin to understand that it changes us it changes us God is calling us back to this place to where you and I become these supernatural people that are walking around because we know that the word of God and the power of God have been residing in us and empowering us to be what God wants us to be. And listen, we're not tossed to and fro as the Bible tells us. We're not tossed to and fro every time a new idea comes along, every time a new teaching comes along, every time a new philosophy comes along, every time a new difficulty comes along. We're not tossed to and fro because we're not hooked to that anymore. We're hooked to this and that source is going to keep us secure. Do you realize that? Do you realize, listen, part of the things that you suffer in life aren't because of God, it's because of us. So when God gave us the word, he knew that his son would come to earth and he wanted us to know that that was his son. When Jesus Christ was resurrected, he knew that all those coming after would not be able to see the son. So he wanted to have a source that spoke about him before he came, that spoke about him while he was here, and that spoke about him after he left so that we would undeniably know who God is. And so he, through this supernatural power of the Spirit, allowed these people to hear from him. And so if you and I want to hear from God, if you're ever in that place where you say, God, I need a word from you, don't go out and look up in the clouds. Open the word of God. Amen. Amen. Now, I, I, I hope you're understanding what I'm saying. We often pick this book up and think it's just a book. We think it's just words. Just imagine yourself 
sitting at the feet of God himself. You would have your back turned to him because he would consume you if you looked at him. He is so majestic, so awesome, so wonderful. Who, this God that created you, that could put you into non-existence by the breath of his mouth. He could, he's, he's so powerful that he speaks and this world is created. He speaks and this universe is created. He speaks and the sun is hung exactly where it needs to be so that the earth rotates just at the right way. And then the moon is there, which affects all of it. This is the God that we're sitting before. And this is the God that says, I care about you so much that I want to speak to you. Listen, do you ever feel like in life sometimes you're all alone? Ever been in that place where you feel like God doesn't care? Can I tell you right now, that's always a lie. God does care. He cares so much about you and I that he's, he, he, he spoke over and over and over and over. Are you tired of hearing me talk? And over and over. And have you not? And over and over. You say, God, I need another word. He's like, listen, you got so many words right now, you can't even keep up with them. Just take in what I've given you and keep taking it in and taking it in because my word is like a layer and you go into it and I'll give you a little bit and then you'll come back next year and I'll give you a little bit more from the same verse. I read the Bible and every time I read the same thing, God shows me something different. He shows me a different piece of him even though I'm reading the same words I'm like God I can't fathom how deep you are and he says you're right you can but if you'll keep coming deeper I'll keep taking you deeper and so God's word listen he says this word is not of private interpretation it didn't come from man and listen it's not up to man to tell it what to say the word says what it says. You, don't, you and I don't get to determine what it says. You see, my job is just simply to tell you what it said. My job is not to change what it said, not to manipulate, to manipulate what it said. And you and I are the same way. Listen, we're not here to change the word of God. We're here to understand the word of God. We're here to follow the word of God. Why? Because anything else doesn't bring us freedom. It brings us bondage. And so here's what. God's word is not for me to figure out a new interpretation of it, my, my responsibility is simply to look at God's word and say, what did God intend to tell me? Amen? What does God want to say? How does God want to say it? And, and, and listen to what he says. It comes from him, not from me. So if I make it say what I want it to say, it no longer comes from him it's my word then isn't it you think your word is powerful if you anchor yourself to your word that's what you're floating around in life with it doesn't have the power of God's word and so when we think we're so smart that we change it to make it say what we want to to make it fit our lifestyle or fit our behavior it's no longer God's word anymore it's your word it's your idea, it's your philosophy, and it has no power to it. So don't think that you've come up with a great idea and a great way to invite something else into your life that everybody else will accept. I wanna tell you right now, if you accept something contrary to God's word, you're accepting something that's gonna anchor you to something in life that you will not be able to stand in the trials and difficulties of life. And then you'll wonder, what in the world's wrong with you? God's saying, because you didn't listen to me. Mm. And I want you to grasp this. In 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Paul reiterates this same truth. He says, all scripture is inspired by God. And what that word means is inspired. It means, it means God breathed it. The very breath of God is giving us his words and is useful to teach us what is true. And to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It, what's that word? Come on, come on, church. It what? I know it hurts, right? Because when you're crooked, it's hard to be made straight, right? You know, the older I get when I sit down and I, uh, I've, I've worked too hard, 
uh, stand up like this, you know, because my back is like, oh, it don't want to come with me. That's what it feels like sometimes when God gets a hold of you. you know, he's like, I'm going to straighten you out. And you're like, oh, God, no, that hurts, that hurts. He said, yeah, but it's going to feel better when you get upright. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> he strains us out and teaches us what is right. Remember that? What is true and what is right. It is God's way of preparing us in every way, fully equipped for every good thing God wants us to do. And so we need God's word so we can have God's direction, so we can have God's truth, so we can go in the right direction, and so that we can be prepared for all that's in front of us, for all that God wants us to do. And so God's word that comes to us is from God, and it has him as the source because he is the only one who can do that. And so God's word is not only inspired by God, because it came from God, who is always truthful, it is without error as it originally came to us. And so here is this in inerrant word of God that we have so that we can trust in it. You see, I got to know it's from God to be able to trust in it. And so when we look at the Bible, it's not one book, okay? Just for you guys to know. Because you want to know why you can trust it, all right? It's not one book. There's 66 of them. 39 Old Testament books. 27 New Testament books. In all of those books are not in error with each other. They support each other. They teach a consistent truth. And in them, from the book of Genesis all the way through the book of Revelation, there's a thread through all of those books that talks about the Savior of the world, Jesus Christ. Consistently, over and over, God's doing this. And, and God allowed man to bring all of these books together in something that we call the canon. The Apocrypha is not a part of that. It comes together and it calls the canon. And this whole idea of canon actually translates a standard. And here's the thing. When all of these books come together, what man's responsibility was is not to come up with the canon of Scripture, the, the standard for what put all these books together. It was simply to discover what God had already done. And so how in the world did they discover that all of these books were supposed to be a part of this Bible that we have today? How in the world did they do that? Well, what they did, I want to give you four, four ideas here. So uh, put on your learning hats just for a second, okay? Because uh, I don't want you to be ignorant and tossed to and fro. I want you to be grounded to the anchor. And so first of all, it was, was it written by a prophet? In other words, someone that had been identified as a prophet. Somebody that spoke about the future and it actually happened. Somebody that was speaking for very words of God. You see this in Hebrews 1, 1 through 2, and in 2 Peter 1, 20 through 21. God uses that standard. The second, uh, the second aspect was, was it written and confirmed by an act of God? Did, did God do something in lieu of what that person said so that we would know that God actually said it and God actually did what he said he was going to do when they spoke? You know why they call a false prophet? Somebody that says they're speaking for God and it doesn't happen. You know what they did with those people? They stoned them. They didn't get a lot of second chances. And so they were very scared to be saying that, hey, God told me. You know, we do that a lot today, don't we? You know what God told me to tell you? And he may have. But if you knew you were going to be stoned because you're wrong, we wouldn't say that so quickly, would we? I'm pretty sure, 99% sure that God told me to say this. But just in case you want to throw something at me, there's that 1%, I might be wrong, just saying, okay? That's my escape plan. But these guys didn't have that. They spoke because they really understood that God was speaking to them. The other thing is, is does it tell the truth about God? Does it consistently tell the truth about who God is? You find that in Deuteronomy 18.22 and Galatians 1.8. I would read all these verses to you, but uh, they only give me so much time to talk to you. And does it have the power of God? Now, I want you to understand this in Hebrews 4.12. The Word of God contains the power of God. 
Words have power, don't they? You tell your wife, man, you look great today. She walks out of the house like this. <laughs> or, yeah, however they walk, I don't know how that works, okay? If you tell somebody something that empowers them, it changes them. And that's what the Word of God is. The Word of God empowers us. You see, it's not words on a page. It is words that have been written from God so that the power of God, when the Word is used, will be released in your life. And so God is saying, listen, this is a supernatural revelation. Don't tamper with it. Let it come into your life so it can do what it needs to do so that you can feel and sense the power of it. How do I know there's power in it? Listen, when I first got saved, and I've shared this before, when I first got saved, um, I had this filthy mouth. God changed that. But the thing that sort of lingered was is I, I, had, a, I had anger issues. And I, I would get angry at stupid stuff. And I didn't know how to stop it. I mean, because now I'm a Christian. This is not looking good, okay? I wasn't even thinking about being a pastor then. I was just thinking about living for Jesus, you know? And so God showed me something. He said, Greg, I have the cure for your anger. It wasn't a psychologist. It wasn't a self-help. This is what God told me. I want you to memorize verses that deal with anger. And so I began to memorize them. Anger rests in the bosom of the fools. And so God's saying, Greg, when you get angry, you're a fool. You actually act one, one too. And so I memorized that. And so what I would do is when I would begin to feel angry, I would start quoting those verses. And this is what God did. God released the power of his word in my life through the Holy Spirit, and it changed my anger. It changed me by God's power and by God's word because his power was released through his word. Why? Because his word contains his power. The two aren't separated. The word of God is the written word about the Savior, and it has the power that can be released in our life from the Savior. And so if you want power... To overcome something in your life, the Word has it. Listen, some of you are negative nannies. You're negative about everything. Glass is half empty. I can't believe you didn't fill the glass up. It's almost empty. And all you see is what's wrong in the world. Can I tell you that God has the cure for what you're thinking about? He can change that about you. And you're not going to find it on CNN. You're not going to find it on Fox News. You're going to have to go to the Word of God to get it, okay? Amen. Amen. So you start memorizing that. Why? Because there's power in it. And so here's the question is, is that now that we have the word and we're saying it's from God, then, 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 then how do we know that we actually have what God intended for us to have? Because it's important if I'm going to trust it, I've got to know that I have what he, what he intended me to have. And, and so, um, you know, in order to validate something, uh, you would want to be able to compare it to something else, wouldn't you? You want to be able to say, hey, here, here, here's a copy over here and there's a copy over here and all these copies, they, they sort of, they match up together. And, you know, one of the other things you want to do is if I'm writing about an event, listen, if you're writing about something that happened 400 years ago, you know, you weren't there and you didn't have a memory. All you had was what somebody told you. So copies and distance between the writing. Now, I want, to, I want to give you a little lesson here. If you take Homer's writings, and I, you probably, I don't even know if you teach this in school anymore. You're like, who is Homer? Well, he's not some country guy down at the, at the fruit stand that sells vegetables, all right? That's not Homer. He may be Homer, but he's not this Homer, okay? But the Homer, he wrote a, 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 a writing called the Iliad. And I want you to know that we teach that in school as fact. Do you know that 
there are only two copies of that book in all the time. There's only two copies of it that we've ever found. And so if, 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 I, if I wanted you to understand this and get you grasped what's going on there, um, I would say here's when Homer lived. And the copies that we have are 643 years after the actual event of his life. That's a long time to try to remember stuff that you never experienced and never uh, had a collection with. You, you've got to remember what people have told you. You've got to find little pieces. And actually, there's, there's two copies that are fully contained. There's like 643 little partial copies. And so, there's Homer. Now, I'm just trying to give you a picture here, okay? Plato. How many of you have heard of Plato? All right? Plato, he had a, he had a, a, a writing, and his writing was, uh, well, he had multiple, but the Republic, uh, which was one of the things he read, there's, there's actually seven copies of it. Now, those seven copies are, are you see where Homer is? Well, the seven copies of this are 900 years away from when the actual event happened. So the further you get away from eyewitnesses' account, the more inaccurate it tends to become. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. But we count these books as they got to be from those people, even though we got no proof. We teach them as such that they are the writings of Plato, the writings of Homer. Well, let me tell you about the Bible, okay? The Bible, how many copies do you think the Bible are out there? Not, not, not what we have currently, but uh, from historical Greek, Hebrew, that kind of stuff. 24 thousand partial copies or full copies 24,000 and those 24,000 weren't written 900 years away or 600 and something years away those 2400 24,000 copies were written many of them within 50 years of the actual event 50 years now this is why this is important the people who penned and copied the Bible were so close to the event that many of them had actually even witnessed the event. There's only 50 years here. And so they can validate what's really happened. They can validate it was true. They can, they can actually talk to the people who many of them experienced it so that they would know as they're copying this that I have the original copy. I have the original intent. These guys, there's no way they can know. But here they could. And so we have 24,000 copies of something that could be be verified that close and so God is trying to get you to understand you can trust the Bible because I've done everything in my power so that you would know that this is my word it hasn't been corrupted it hasn't been altered it's exactly what I wanted it to be and so Christian when you come to the Bible you can come with confidence why because you got to know and you got to know that you know that you know that this is God's truth And that it's accurate. And it'll do what it says it'll do. And so because of that, I can trust it. Because of that, I can trust it above anything else. Because there's no other book in history that does what the Bible does. There's no other book in history that can be authenticated the way the Bible does. And so why in the world would we trust what man says when we can trust what God says? Because since it is from God, listen, it'll do what God tells us. Since it is from God, it will teach us what is true. Now listen, you got to want to hear what's true though, don't you? Because if you want to hear what's true, it'll tell you. If you don't want to hear it, don't open it up. Because regardless, it's going to tell you what's true. It's going to tell you what's true in this world, but it's going to tell you what's true about you and I. It will show us in our life what is wrong in our lives. You read the Bible and you are having problems with your kids, God is going to show you what the answer is. 
You're reading the Bible and you want to know what's wrong with your attitude? God is going to show you what the answer is. So if you don't want to change your attitude, don't read the Bible. But if you want to be different, then I promise you the Bible will show you what's wrong. Because we know in anything, in order to fix it, you got to know what's wrong with it first, don't you? And so in order for God to fix us, he wants us to know what's wrong with us. And he's going to tell us that. He's going to tell us the truth about it. And then he's going to straighten us out oh, by teaching us what's right. The Bible will straighten you out. So why does the devil not want you to read your Bible? Because he wants to use you. He wants to influence you. And he knows that when you Bible, when you begin to read it, God will straighten your life out and you become useless to him and useful for Jesus. Amen? Because we don't need a bunch of Christians walking around telling people, you know, I think it says somewhere in the Bible. Listen, if you don't know what it says, don't quote it. Why? Because it's becoming your word, not his word. There's power in his word. And so it's going to do all these things. And, and listen, God, listen, God's through his word is going to prepare us in every way for every good work he wants us to do. God is going to prepare us. And so you say, God, I want to be used by you. And God said, well, I got to fill you up first because I don't want your junk leaking out on everybody. I want my stuff leaking out on everybody. And then he's going to equip us. So what we begin to see is what we talked about. God has given us everything for that life of godliness as we talked about last week. God has given us that so that we can live. And so what God wants us to grasp is, is because the Bible is from him, because we can prove the Bible's from him, because it's inspired, because it's without error, because it's infallible, that you and I can build our life on the truth that's there. And when we build our life on that truth, what happens is that we stay anchored to the author of truth the author of life whose name is Jesus Christ and we cannot be moved in life circumstances because my God can move life circumstances amen and so you don't you don't dabble in this Christian Christian life thing listen you don't dabble in it you know oh I'm gonna go to church this week Woo! gold star for you no 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 my life depends on what I get from this word. And so if you and I are going to secure the anchor, if you and I are going to stop being tossed to and fro, as the Bible says, by every wind of doctrine, by every teaching of man and idea of man, then you and I have to secure ourselves to the anchor. You and I have to come back to the place where we allow God to straighten us out and reveal to us where we are living in contradiction to what he is saying. Because listen, many of us, we are tossed because number one, we don't know the word. We don't know it. You can't pick it up once a year and know it. You say, but why do I need to know it? Because of everything we just talked about. If you don't know it, shipwreck is coming. If you don't know it, you will not be useful for God. Why? Here, this is what I see. I can see the cycle. You get all excited about God and you want to volunteer and serve somewhere. And you sign up to serve and then you run out of gas. Why? Because you're running off your gas rather than his gas. Amen? Why? Because as soon as something hard happens, you quit. Why do you quit? It's because you're not hooked to the source and getting empowered by the source and the word of God that gives you what you need to give somebody else. You see, we don't have what we need to give to somebody else. I don't have what I need to stand up here in front of you and give you what God wants by myself. It has to be God. And when I walk off this stage, I'm telling you, this is like an out-of-body experience because when I walk off this stage, I'm like, I can't believe that just happened. Thank you, God, it wasn't me. Because if it was me, I knew what happened. That's what God wants in your life. 
God wants to use you. But if I don't trust it, for many of us, I don't because I don't know it. For others of us, listen, we don't trust it because we're really not convinced it's from God. Because if it were, listen, if it were, if this were really from God, like we're saying, if it were, and you and I really believed it, you know what we do? We'd follow it with our whole heart. We wouldn't have to hear the same sermon over and over again. We would believe it. We would believe that when God says, give your first 10% to him and I will bless you. We believe that. But church, we don't believe that. You don't believe it. 83% of you don't believe it. Why? Well, you don't believe this is the word of God. If you believed it, you would follow it. If you believed it, you would follow after what it's telling you to do because you'd realize that the creator of the universe knows what's better for your life than you and I do. And if I follow the creator of the universe, I step into an area where I can be blessed and I can be released and I can have joy and I can have peace and I can have all the promises that God gives me. So it's imperative that we believe it. We don't have a choice, and our choice to do something else or believe something else is going to shipwreck our lives. And so what God is wanting us to understand is this word, don't change it, because this word is my word, and this word will never go out of date. It will never expire. It will never come obsolete, because I will never be obsolete. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword cutting between the soul and the spirit. What other knife will ever do that? Only God's knife, his word. And in between the joint and the marrow, it exposes the innermost thoughts and desires of man. That's what God does. That's what only God can do. And that's what you and I need. And so this morning, listen. For some of us, it's time to get off the feeling train. It's time to stop listening to what everybody else is saying. And it's time to get back in the word. It's time to get back to that place where we come back to Jesus and we secure the anchor. Because listen, some of us are floating and we're, we're, we're waiting for shipwreck. It's time for you to re-secure the anchor in your life and get back to what God is calling you to be about. And we challenged you last week with your Bible app to begin to get into God's word and stay in God's word. But I want you to understand, listen, if you're tired of being tossed, then time to re-secure the anchor. If you're looking for direction, then re-secure the anchor. If you want to know what's wrong with you, then re-secure the anchor. If you want to know what's God God wants you to do in your life, then re-secure the anchor. If you're overcome by depression, then re-secure, re-concern, re, whatever I saying. <laughs> re-secure the anchor. If you and I want to get to the place in our lives where we are able to stand in our marriage, stand with our kids, stand with our family, stand with everybody else that needs Jesus, then we've got to re-secure the anchor, church. So this morning, listen. fast approaching the end of November and God is challenging us so I want to ask you if you've been reading your Bible app or your Bible for the last seven days I'm calling you out stand to your feet If you're sitting down, that's okay. I'm not trying to embarrass you. I want to tell everybody that's standing up right now, you are walking in dangerous territory. You're becoming a threat to the enemy. He's going to come after you. But I want you to stand in the Word because there's power there. Don't give up. Don't quit. That Word of God will change you so much that you won't realize what happened in your life and you'll be walking on other waters that you never walked on because God's going to do something supernatural in you. As you're standing, everybody else that wants to join this crowd this week, maybe you, maybe you didn't read it every day last week, but this week is a different week. If you want to stand with them and say, Greg, this morning I'm getting into the Word. I'm going to believe and walk with what God wants me to, then I want you to stand to your feet and say, you know what, I, I, didn't, I didn't succeed last week, but I hadn't failed yet because life is still in front of me. Greg, I want to be there. Listen, this is not a guilt thing. This is you wanting to be what God called you to be and to stand on His Word because if you don't stand on His Word, you won't stand at all. 
Amen. Some of you don't have a Bible app. I understand that. Maybe you got a Bible. Maybe you want to do soap. I don't care what you do. Get into God's Word. Start reading the Psalms. Start reading the Gospel of John. Start somewhere. Don't start in Leviticus. Just saying. But with everybody standing, I want to ask you this. If you're here this morning and you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't have the power you need in your life to change your marriage, to change your habit, to change your hurt, to change your sorrow. And I want to invite you to know Jesus this morning. You see, you can read about the author, but you got to know the author. And this morning, I'm inviting you to have a personal relationship with Jesus. He is the answer that you've been looking for. He is the peace that you've been looking for. So as our band comes back out, I'm going to pray for us. Our team's going to be down front. And listen, if you're standing for Jesus and you're standing to be in his word, then you keep standing. But if God has shown you something in your life you need to get rid of, then maybe come front and just, just pray this morning. Say, God, I need to release this. You revealed this to me. I need to get it out of my life. But for others of you, you're standing here and you've been running from God and you know you need to have him in your life this morning, then your chance is to come down front and say, I need to know Jesus as my Savior. And one of these guys or ladies will show you how to know Jesus. If you need to be released from something, you need to be healed through the power of Jesus. And you come down and we will anoint you and pray over you so that the God of heaven will cure you and release you. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, through your power and your sufficiency, God, I pray and thank you for the victory that these Christians have had, this church has had in reading your word and digesting your word, God. I pray for further victory for all of those that are standing this morning who's saying, I want to have God's word in my life. And God, for that person that's running from you, is ready to run to you, God, to have Jesus to be their savior. God, as we sing this song, I pray that they would move, God, so that they can become a child of God, so that they can be delivered from all those things that's holding them back and holding them down, God. And I pray, God, for that believer that that you've revealed that thing to them, God. I pray you release them this morning as they come to be prayed over. And for that person that's suffering from that sickness, God, or that disease or that illness, in the name of Jesus, God, I pray they be obedient and walk by faith down here so that we can pray over them so that the God of heaven can heal them, God. May you get the glory during this time, God. May we walk in obedience. It's in your name we pray.